welcome back everybody for another exciting installment. So today we're going to be looking at Unit 8, Topics 8.5, 8.6, and 8.10, which are eutrophication, thermal pollution, and sewage treatment. All right, the enduring understanding that accompanies this unit so far is that human activities, including the use of resources, have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for ecosystems. So, all right, when you read, which you should do, uh, we are in Chapter 17 of the Miller textbook. We're going to read Sections 17.1 and 17.2, pages 5 through, through 540, and then also Section 17.5, pages 550 to 556. All right, let's dig in. So a new term for you guys is this term oligotrophic. All right, so uh, we're going to differentiate between oligotrophic and eutrophic bodies of water first before we talk about that process of eutrophication. But oligotrophic waters are much like the lakes and uh, uh, ponds that we have here in the Pacific Northwest, right? So oligotrophic bodies of water are unenriched, they're clear, right? Um, and uh, you know, easily seen through and tend to have lots of dissolved oxygen and so on, okay? So they uh, have good light penetration, high levels of dissolved oxygen, often colder alpine lakes. Now, this says low nutrient levels, which might at, at base value seem uh, like that would make it a, a less desirable body of water. But the, uh, we'll talk about the role nutrient levels plays in the water with like algae growth and so on. So oligotrophic bodies of water, low nutrient levels, good light penetration, high dissolved oxygen. They tend to be deep, right? Small amounts of algae. And then they have species of fish and other aquatic organisms that are well adapted to that type of water. Okay? Now let's contrast that with a eutrophic body of water. Okay? Now, uh, it is worth pointing out that there are bodies of water. Um, that are naturally eutrophic. So it's not that eutrophic is good or bad per se. It's just that uh, it's a different, uh, sets up a different ecosystem, essentially, right? So eutrophic bodies of water have high nutrient levels, poor light penetration, and low dissolved oxygen. And we tend to see lots of algae going on it. Okay? Uh, so this picture right here is a good example. Now, again, types of organisms that we have living in our eutrophic bodies of water are well adapted to that type of uh, condition, okay? Uh, now, one thing that can happen, right, is we can have a body of water switch from oligotrophic to eutrophic because of human activity, all right? So agricultural runoff or sewage pollution can increase the nutrients in that body of water and kickstart a chain reaction that causes a switch, which can be problematic, and we'll talk about why here. So eutrophication is that process I just described, okay? So eutrophic waters are fine if that is the natural state and the organisms living in that eutrophic body of water are already adapted to that low light penetration, low oxygen environment, okay, like carp and bullhead and so on, okay? Uh, the trouble is when we have organisms in an oligotrophic body of water and because of pollution from either sewage or agricultural runoff, that body of water changes over to a eutrophic condition. Okay, that causes a decrease in dissolved oxygen. We have organisms that aren't adapted to those conditions and therefore we can end up with a mass die off. So um, we want to be able to describe this eutrophication process. So it usually begins with an increase in plant and algal nutrients, right? So primarily talking about an increase in nitrates and phosphates, okay? So those are uh, in essential uh, uh, elements, or sorry, compounds for plant and algal growth, right? And so if we increase the amount of plant and algal nutrients in a body of water, we're going to get a big increase in algae, which we call an algal bloom. Okay, now algae are 
are photosynthesizing organisms. They're food for things like carp and bullhead. All right, so again, carp and bullhead naturally uh, thrive in this sort of condition. Now, the reason that increase in algae and the increase in plant and algal nutrients is problematic is uh, we end up with a big increase in what's called biological oxygen demand, right? BOD for short, that's biological oxygen demand. Okay? Now, when we increase the demand for oxygen, what's happening there is as that algae blooms, we get a big growth of algae. And again, it'll look like this. Let me take you back to that picture. A whole bunch of algae growing, right? With that, we also have to understand that the algae is continuously reproducing, dying off, and decomposing, right? So as that algae decomposes, the bacteria that decomposes that bacteria uses up the lion's share of the oxygen available in that water. And with a big increase in biological oxygen demand, we get a big decrease in dissolved oxygen. All right? Now, if the fish and other organisms are not well adapted to that low oxygen environment, which we call hypoxia or hypoxic water, all right, we get a die off of organisms. Right, so we're going to get a bunch of dead fish. Okay, so again, this eutrophication process, you guys want to understand or describe the steps involved. You get an increase in plant and algal nutrients, typically going to be because of uh, agricultural runoff or from sewage pollution. All right. If that happens to an oligotrophic body of water, we get an increase in the nutrients in the water. We get an increase in algae, called an algal bloom, algal bloom, that has a big increase in the demand for oxygen and a corresponding decrease in available oxygen, create hypoxic conditions that are harmful to fish that are not well adapted to those conditions. All right, now uh, let's, let's express this uh, process in um, graph form. All right, so let's say we get some point source pollution Right, so a sewage pipe is leaking into a nearby stream. Low flow, maybe it's a slow flowing stream. All right, um, or we could have non point source which would come from my agricultural runoff, right? Right, either one of those can bring in some plant and algal nutrients, right? So let's say, though, we have a point source sewage spill into our stream, right? So this x-axis is showing the distance away from that stream. So we have a big increase in biological oxygen demand near that spill site or that point source pollution, right? So again, if it was sewage, that would bring in a ton of plant and algal nutrients, right? Our biological oxygen demand skyrockets because we're going to get that algal bloom. All right, which is going to increase our biological oxygen demand, which is going to decrease our dissolved oxygen. All right, when the dissolved oxygen gets below a certain point, we get some dead fish. Now, notice though, this being a stream, water's flowing, right? Uh, this way, notice that we get the fish kill not right at the site of that spill, but downstream as that those bacteria decompose that algae downstream from that sewage spill, that's where we get that big decrease in biological or in dissolved oxygen and a fish kill, right? But notice too that we do get a recovery of that dissolved oxygen farther and farther away from that spill site, right? Pretty good chance of seeing a graph like this one on the AP test. It's a really common depiction of that relationship between plant and algal nutrients uh, in a stream ecosystem where we have a point source pollutant. All right, um, now thermal pollution, uh, I'm including this one right next to it. It is a topic, um, and it's a topic we've already talked about a little bit, but as we increase um, the temperature of a body of water, right, so as temperature uh, increases, 
right, the dissolved oxygen capacity decreases. Okay, so keep in mind, as um, we heat water now, heated water could come from, right, um, something like global warming, but it could also come from a power plant, like a nuclear power plant, for example. And again, nuclear power plants are not polluting water with radioactive material. They are using an excessive amount of water for, as it could, right, and then releasing that heated water back to the environment. Uh, perhaps back into a very large stream. That heated water, right, is released into waterways, okay, and that can affect the amount of dissolved oxygen. So again, uh, increase temp leads to a decrease in dissolved oxygen, right? And then again, depending on the specific range of tolerance for the fish in that ecosystem, right, that might put the amount of oxygen outside their range tolerance, and then again, uh, can lead to massive die-offs in aquatic species. All right. Now, um, case in point, and this is actually talked about in the uh, the very first page of Chapter 17, a little case in point there. But again, we have the Mississippi uh, Drainage Basin, Mississippi River Watershed, which covers much of uh, North, uh, the United States, east of the Rockies. All right. Now, that entire drainage basin is a huge agricultural area all right and so because the mississippi river drains such an incredibly large agricultural area it is bringing lots of plant and algal nutrients into the mississippi river that mississippi river empties out into the gulf of mexico all right and in the gulf of mexico there is a frequent uh kind of pool that of water in the Gulf of Mexico that they refer to as the dead zone. And that is because it is hypoxic. Right? Basically what that means, sorry, I did not spell that very well. Hypoxic. Which basically means it is depleted of that essential oxygen. Alright. Now, last but not least, we're going to get to uh, municipal sewage treatment. Now, in municipal sewage treatment, um, there are several phases, right? We have what's called primary treatment. So again, you you guys are serviced at your household if you're on like a municipal system with uh, treated drinking water. That's what comes in your plumbing, through your sinks. It actually goes into your toilet, even though that doesn't really have to be clean water. It's basically the same water that comes out of your sink, right? It's what comes out of your shower, anything, uh, your hose, your sprinklers, etc. That's typically if it comes from a city supply bin uh, treated a certain way, clean water. Now, uh, the water that leaves your house is no longer clean. It's gone down the drain. It may be uh, filled with uh, maybe soapy dish water, might be bath water, shower water, or toilet water, or from your sink where you spit your toothpaste in it, right? All that water leaves your house typically through the same set of pipes and goes to a municipal sewage treatment plant. Now, some of you guys, if you're not uh, within city limits, you might be on a septic system that sort of does these same processes uh, underground somewhere in your yard, okay? Uh, minus the chlorine disinfection that we'll talk about here shortly. But the primary treatment is basically um, allowing the, the solids, right? So, and the liquids to settle out, right? So we're going to get a settling out at the bottom of what's called sludge, right? That is the solids. On top of that, we're going to have our liquid, wastewater. Okay, so the primary treatment is essentially removing suspended and floating particles through mechanical processes. Secondary treatment, then, is where we go by decomposing the suspended organic material, okay, which reduces biological oxygen. And we'll talk about what that process looks like here in a little bit. All right, so sewage sludge, right, is a vocab term. That's the solids remaining after primary and secondary treatment has been completed. So those solids that settle out to the bottom, right, that's separated out, right? So one of the waste products is the sludge. The other waste product is that liquid wastewater. 
So the sludge is kind of what's left over. All right. Now that sewage sludge can be both aerobically and anaerobically decomposed. All right. And it could theoretically be composted. Okay. So composting kills harmful pathogens, right? Uh, okay. Uh, and allows the converted sludge to essentially be used like a, a fertilizer, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, now this is done anaerobically. Right, just like with our, our cow manure, cow waste, we do produce some methane. So typically at a uh, sewage treatment plant, we see uh, a, plant, a location, you might see a little uh, a pipe with a flame coming out of it. That is then burning off the methane so that they're releasing CO2 instead of methane, right? And again, uh, CO2 is not the greatest thing to release, but it is a less potent greenhouse gas than methane. Now, we could also use that methane for energy Right, if they have the infrastructure or some sort of grant to help fund a system that does that. Typically, they're going to produce methane in the treatment plant, burn that off, and release CO2, which is a less, less harmful to the ecosystem. Okay? Now, um, so tertiary treatment, okay? So again, in, in secondary treatment, right, we're taking uh, our wastewater, Right, and we're biologically, so using bacteria, fungus, protozoans, right, to decompose the organic material, right, and um, leave it essentially uh, much cleaner, right? So all the human waste, detergents, and so on are essentially just decomposed back into carbon dioxide and uh, simpler materials, okay? So um, it goes from that primary sedimentation tank, again, where we get that sludge separated out. The wastewater goes to that secondary treatment where it's aerated. They give it some extra oxygen to help decompose it, okay? And then it eventually leaves that system and goes through some chlorine disinfection. Now, that is important, right? Because that kills off harmful uh, pathogens that might still be in that water. Now, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, our water goes through what's called a tertiary treatment. And this is more of an advanced wastewater treatment method that uh, um, helps reduce phosphorus and nitrogen. Now, again, those, if released into the environment, can cause that eutrophication process. Right? Uh, so the wastewater leaving a sewage treatment plant, if it's only gone through primary and secondary, it's no longer, uh, and with chlorine treatment, it's no longer harmful in terms of having nasty, like, uh, uh, fecal coliform, E. coli bacteria, or other viruses and so on, right? So it's clean of that, but it's still going to be really high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Tertiary treatment, right, is... Uh, not always employed, but when it is, it's usually going to involve some way of reducing those plant natural algal nutrients so we don't get that eutrophication process. So what you see in the picture here is an example of using a wetland, right? So rather than re releasing uh, wastewater, which again is no longer harmful per se after secondary treatment, uh, but it might still be high in plant algal nutrients directly into a stream or body of water, they first run it through a wetland. And if you guys recall, way back when we talked about wetlands, those are an excellent water purifier. So what happens is that plants and algae and other organisms that occupy wetlands absorb much of that nitrogen and phosphorus, right? So we're going to have a big decrease in nutrients leaving that sewage treatment plant and therefore no eutrophication that might result as a without um, tertiary treatment. Okay? That takes us to the final step again, which is that disinfection. They use chlorine or UV light uh, to kill the harmful pathogens that remain. Okay, so it's a pretty cool little graphic right here. It shows which step in treatment uh, gets rid of those. So notice that phosphorus and nitrogen aren't reduced until after a tertiary treatment. Okay, uh, the pathogens that we worry about, they get the, the final, so those do get reduced with each step, but we end up pathogen-free 
after that chlorine or UV treatment. Okay, our sewage solids are taken care of during that primary treatment. All right, um, I believe that takes us to the very end. Um, and I did want to quickly uh, talk about one thing that is helpful. So notice we have a stream, right, surrounded by agricultural fields. Now, we just learned what might happen as water runs off from those agricultural fields into that stream, right? We could get some non-point source pollution, uh, uh, probably fertilizer runoff in this case, right, into that stream, which would increase uh, algae, increase biological oxygen demand, and decrease dissolved oxygen. We get that eutrophication process. What a riparian buffer does, a riparian buffer is the zone of vegetation, right, that we have immediately adjacent to that stream. And these are really common right here in Walla Walla, by the way, right? Now, what that does is uh, it, the riparian buffer absorbs a lot of that runoff that might come from that agricultural field, preventing much of that increase in nutrients from actually getting into the stream. So the, the trees and the plants, um, not only do they help prevent erosion, right, but they also absorb a lot of those nutrients, preventing that increase in nutrients, which would kickstart that eutrophication process. So riparian buffers are a super uh, low maintenance and natural way to help prevent pollution of streams that are near uh, agricultural areas. All right, uh, that is it. The end.